So I've been asked here to talk about uh, how do we get energy efficiency out of digital and make signal systems um, while we are waiting for that new device to come on board. Um, while we are waiting for the new device, the, we are stuck with CMOS devices that have been marching on for a, a, along the Moore's law for a while. There have been some slowdowns in Moore's law now and we have to figure out how to extract more energy efficiency out of current systems. First, uh, let me just quickly review what do we, you know, what is this, what we think is energy efficiency. Energy efficiency is something that uh, relates performance and pow uh, to power. Um, we can say that the performance is proportional to the power and that proportionality constant is energy efficiency. If we express the, the performance in the number of tasks that, that we can perform per second uh, and power in joules per second, energy efficiency comes out uh, measured in tasks per joule. If we have a power constrained system, we need better, better energy efficiency to achieve more performance. On the other hand, many of the, the systems um, that are performance constrained, we need better energy efficiency to achieve lower power. So most systems today are either power or performance constrained and we do want to get the other aspect, either you know, higher performance um, under constrained power or uh, lower power under performance constraints. And the, the way how to do that is by improving energy efficiency in both ways. What we'll see in the systems, however, is that Efficiency, we usually don't measure in these tasks per joule, although it should be, uh, but we try to find a proxy to it. We usually tend to multiply that and divide by seconds and then end up with either gigaops per watt or gigaflops per watt, depending whether the machine has a floating point unit or not. The other thing that uh, we have noticed, uh, you know, what people have observed over time is that uh, specialization in the function that it performs uh, for a system improves energy efficiency at the expense of the flexibility. So the most flexible um, systems that we have are uh, CPUs um, because they can run any type of, uh, say, C code on them, but they achieve somewhere around uh, um, one uh, gigaflop per watt of energy efficiencies. Um, if we add a GPU to that system, uh, we can be more energy efficient, a few gigaflops uh, per watt, but uh, okay, <laughs> uh, graphics processing unit is, uh, is uh, something that uh, people often use, you know, people use for video gaming or displaying things on the, on, the, on the screen, but they also use them for computing now. They're very popular for computing. However, if we are trying to do computing using a GPU, we end up, uh, um, we have to use some specialized code like CUDA on, on uh, NVIDIA processors, on N NVIDIA GPUs. Even more efficient would be DSPs, but they usually need special programming techniques and we cannot just take um, any C code and compile on them and get them to be uh, energy efficient. If we want to be really efficient in performing certain tasks, we can design dedicated hardware um, that is just performing that, for example, uh, you know, fast Fourier transform, and we can have a dedicated fast Fourier transform uh, processor that is achieving um, of the order of a tera op, uh, where op would be now an equivalent of integer, you know, uh, eight bit operations, additions, about a tera op per watt, but that chip would be only capable of doing float, uh, you know, uh, fast Fourier transform, nothing else. Um, people say that um, uh, FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays can be um, flexible as well. And yes, they can be more um, efficient depend if they're, if they're uh, well optimized and implementing a particular um, application. But most of the stuff today happens. Most of, the, of the, the systems are implemented using CPUs. So the goal is to make CPUs more energy efficient. Here is a plot that has been compiled by other people that is uh, discussing energy efficiency uh, or, or trends in CPUs. When we take a look at what has been happening with CPUs, they have been primarily driven by Moore's law and by our ability to increase the number of transistors in every technology generation. It has been holding up for uh, on, you know, over four decades, but recently we have been seeing some slow trends in a slowdown of Moore's law. Um, performance has been following 
um, the, the, the improvements in technology, and that has been primarily extracted over a long time, up to the, the early 2000s, by increasing the frequ frequency of processors. Um, when power became limited, the frequency had to be limited as well, because power and frequency are related to each other, and added performance came by increasing the number of cores and extracting parallelism out of the number of cores. What we are seeing now in you know, very recent processors, general processors, is that this performance of parallel applications has been flattening out. So we are stuck, we need something else. This parallelism has been one-time gain, unfortunately. Well, e the way how to increase the e efficiency of parallel processors, if we are in, 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 in one technology node, would be, for example, to use more and slower cores for better energy efficiency. So in order for that to happen, we need either simpler co cores or we need to run course at lower supply voltages and uh, lower frequencies. But both of those approaches have their limit. On one end, having um, you know, simpler and simpler co course is going to eventually reduce to a singularity of something that is not functional. So this is limited by the smallest sensible core. On the other hand, there is a limit in how low we can scale the supply voltage, limited by um, uh, VDD or VT scaling, um, having reasonable uh, performance out of these transistors, and uh, you know, eventually errors that happen at very low voltages. So what? So now what? what? What do we do? Where do we go? Well, on, on the other hand, what we have is uh, are the ASICs as the ultimate way how we get the efficiency. But the ASICs have been dying. The business of building ASICs is, is going away because um, the typically quoted uh, non-recurring engineering costs of, are of the order of $100 million. There are very few things that are really application specific that can amortize a $100 million cost. I mean, that is just in the contrast with its name, application specific. There is a very limited number of things that, that can, can have that model. In addition to, to that, they have very, they're quoted with very long development cycles. They have often need multiple revisions and that, uh, that are limited by um, you know, issues with validation, verification, porting software to it, and so on. Often require a large design teams, and that's why we have, you know, in, on top of that, high cost of tools and risk bins. And as a result, you know, the number of ASIC starts has been going down over time. So, processors are in trouble, ASICs are in trouble. What, what do we do? Well, approach that we have been taking in Berkeley is to try to build domain-specific chips. The way how we do that, we notice that in particular domains, there are um, recurring applications um, in, in particular domain. For example, we'll find out that object <coughs> recognition will often rely on dense or sparse matrix multiplication. So if we can build a processor that can rely on dedicated matrix multiplication, we can make it more efficient. Um, audio recognition tends to use dense matrix multiplication or dense matrix manipulations and graph processing. Um, scene analysis also um, <coughs> can have these basic primitives or what are called Berkeley dwarfs or nowadays called motifs, computational motifs. These motifs um, are depend on the, on the application, but um, people have profiled many, many of these applications and found out there is only 13 of them. These 13 motifs are things that, uh, that, that are commonly implemented uh, and are needed to be, to, to be running applications. <laughs> they um, you know, e include things like you know, what I mentioned, dense and sparse matrix multiplications, Fourier transforms, graph solvers, and so on. Um, and not, they're not needed in every application, so the idea here is that you know, these red dots represent when, where they're hot, which application really you know, runs a lot of them. And some of those um, that, uh, that are blue, they, they're cold. They, they don't, do not rely on them that much. So the idea here is to take the, the software, the applications that we have, um, find their motifs, and then build an ensemble of specialized processors on the bottom. 
um, that would be able to run very efficiently some of this code. For example, you know, there will be instruction level parallelism en engine, there will be a dense engine, there will be a sparse engine, there will be a graph engine um, that will be set for a particular set of applications. And then we will have this magic software that is going to recognize when there is such a pattern that you know, uh, in C code we are trying to multiply a matrix and it is going to find that code and map it optimally onto that specializer. So that's the basic idea. However, we still have to be able to build these domain-specific chips. They are not as specialized as ASICs, but they're still specific, and we have to be able to build them in a, at a reasonable cost. Now, the search space is smaller, but we have to have another advance here. That comes to the idea that we have been keep, kicking around about the agile design. Well, ASICs are not the first thing that, was in, that is in trouble. Software was in trouble about 15 years ago when people realized that something that was popular back then, which was called the waterfall development, was leaving software in trouble. Um, essentially, what would happen there, um, you know, that was a long, there was a long development cycle of, you know, for large software projects that ran over a year, where people would try to analyze the specification, come up with an architecture, um, come up with an implementation, develop a test for it, and then support it. As a result, many projects ran over time. What about 15 years ago happened was a revolution in software development that was called the Agile development, where a number of incomplete but functional prototypes have been iterated with a customer for rapid verification and validation. So mm -hmm. software has been ran into these rapid development cycles that have been iterated with a customer, and as a result, the success of being on time and on, on, you know, within the cost went from 10% to 76% with much higher, um, with, with much more complex projects. But you'll tell me, well, software is not hardware. However, can we borrow something from that? Can we build chips in an agile way? And what I'm trying to do here, I'm going to try, try to argue for that. The idea here is, can we borrow some of the ideas from the agile software development and build hardware in an agile way? Meaning that can we build chips that we can quickly iterate through our design process and build larger and larger versions. In order for that to happen, we have to have a scalable design such that we can scale it up. We have to have a rapid design turnaround. We have to be able to aggressively reuse them. And we have to be able to, add, you know, in an agile way, iterate this with potential customers. We are not, this is not the first time people are facing, software was not the first one that, uh, um, industry that was facing these long development cycles and failures. You know, people have figured that that, that was happening in many medieval uh, large art projects. Um, and uh, many of those took many decades, and, but more interesting are approaches that artists took in the, in the 19th century or 18th and 19th century for their large projects that you know, had sponsors, that are not NSF, but you know, a private sponsor would order a large painting for something. Um, and the approach was very interesting how they took it. They would iterate two things with a customer. A sketch here with a numbered, numbered pe people who are going to be in there in a big scene, or you know, perhaps a sponsor would like to find themselves on, on their, their significant other, um, uh, you know, resembling, resembling faces of some of the historical people. And then there were, they had a generator of faces and a model who they've uh, portrayed extensively for all kinds of things. And these, what we will find out, they would assemble this with, in agreement with a sponsor of, in a big painting. What you will find out, these generators of, uh, of people you know, these faces recurred in many other paintings as, you know, the side people who are not the most important. So can we borrow some of that from the software and from the art and from the big Michelangelo type of projects? So the idea here is, can we be ag agile in the hardware development? Can we build a series of prototypes with very fairly small t teams that can be quickly validated? In order to do that, we need to use a higher level description, higher than what people dominantly use today, which is Verilog. Um, and we can try to rely on many things that have happened. You know, Verilog relies on, on, on C, essentially, which is, you know, developed when I was in elementary school. 
um, things have happened in software since then. We can try to use um, many mod modern programming styles and modern languages to, to build hardware from them. Um, we would like to build generators, not instances. We would like to build generators like this artist has had, such that we can very, um, uh, very quickly validate the design and we can reuse it a lot. Um, we, in hardware, there is no open source and 80 or 90% of the so software out there is built on top of open source. Let's try to see if we can use open source in hardware to save this, this uh, whole uh, uh, value-added market and use rapid design flows. So um, looking into that, let's take an example of how would we apply that to a modern SOC as an example of how some of these uh, domain-specific uh, chips would be developed. Uh, SOC is a system on a chip. Uh, Eli would, would like, you would probably remind me how to, you know, what that is. Um, what you would find on a system on a chip nowadays, you would say, find multiple processor cores, you would find a bus, you would find a lot of memory, uh, typically in the form of SRAM. There would be some high-speed analog uh, uh, blocks and there would be custom DSP. Typically, this is developed in a waterfall development, takes well over a year, and it is over a budget and over time, and there are very uh, few painful successes out there. If I were to apply agile development flow, I would try to strip this down and build the smallest chip I can. The smallest chip um, in 28 nanometer um, it costs only $30,000. That's maybe a lot for a, a small university, but it is really nothing compared to $100 million that we have been talking about uh, of the overall development cost. Um, and what we would do instead of many cores, we would just implement one core, we would implement much you know, downsampled analog system, for example, you know, much smaller cache and essential interfaces such that we can verify and validate all the interfaces and come you know, discuss this with a potential customer who would basically say, yes, this, this is what we would like to see scaled up or no. In order for that to work, we need to have generators that are going to be able to scale this design up. We would have to have an analog generator, processor generator, memory generator, digital, uh, custom digital de generator. We should be able to integrate the third party IP. When we do that in the next uh, version of this chip, we should be able to, oops. We should be able to, um, scale up design to the full-blown version that we wanted to have. And if we do not want to build the, the whole system in the, at the same time, our agile design flow, we don't have to fab every version of this chip. We can have you know, monthly or, or by, you know, twice uh, every other month varia variations of this chip that would be internal tape-ins or prototypes in an FPGA. So in order to do that, we need to build hardware generators, which is a different way of building things. Not, you know, instead of building instances of a design, we would like to build a generator that generates many instances of a design. So how can we do that? Well, let's borrow things from, from software again. In software, there are higher level descriptions. And in Berkeley, we have been using something with a great amount of success that is called, called Chisel. Uh, Chisel stands for constructing hardware in uh, Scala embedded language. Scala is a modern programming language um, and Chisel has been implemented on top of that. Um, it implements many of the, the features of modern programming languages like functional and object oriented programming and it naturally allows for building uh, generators. Um, a great example of that is you know, um, AHP light crossbar that you would find out in a modern S SOC. Um, one of our students has designed in just five lines of code five lines of code, that would be about 100 lines of code in, in Verilog. And believe me, verifying five lines of code is much easier than 100 lines of code. We can also generate analog blocks, but that exceeds, that, you know, that's a special, you know, yet another talk about the Berkeley analog generator. Another huge thing is that we do with, with Chisel is we build processors and we build them and put them in an open source. <laughs> this is a group of Krusty Asanovich that has been building RISC-V ISA. I say is the uh, instruction set architecture. So it's a completely free and open ISA that can be downloaded from uh, risc5.org that runs a full software stack. Every software, you know, most of the software that you need nowadays runs on that ISA 
and you can build it. It is built, it is very simple, it's in a sense of Berkeley risks and has only about 40 instructions but supports compiler, linker and everything else. It is built for extensions, it has a full floating point support. Um, uh, it's comparable to other ISAs designed for extension and there are several silicon prototypes that have been working. It's not <coughs> a toy processor that comes out of it. It's a generator of processors and one of those is, uh, you know, there's multiple processor generators, one of them is a rocket. Um, and rocket is, um, say, somewhere in between ARM Cortex-A5, ARM is a dominant uh, uh, pro processor core vendor, it's somewhere in between A5 and A53 versions. It is very comparable to it. It is a you know, single issue in order six inch pipeline that turns out to be a little bit more efficient than what you can get from from ARM. The bottom line here, this is not a WIMPy processor, it's a real one. Now, final thing that we need to do before I give you an example of what we have done with this is the agile hardware development. We have a fully scripted design flow where we would like to go from a change in chisel code or the bag, analog generator, to a chip layout in less than a day. That is done using similar way how people develop large software projects nowadays. We have a repository where everybody commits their design to a repository that is automatically triggering a recursion test. A recursion goes back to a designer and says, oh, your design is checked in, congratulations, or, oh, you just broke our chip, uh, you know, do it again. As a result, we have these tape-ins, which are LBS clean designs and DRC sane, meaning that can be taped down in a matter of a day or two. So as we build our chip, they get, they can get larger. So a quick example, um, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, is what we have been building here as a proxy to an, to a, to an SOC. So we have built processors that have integrated uh, dynamic voltage scaling and um, integrated um, on-chip voltage conversion. So as an example of that, I'm not going to go into very many details of it, we went on a quest to integrate uh, dynamic uh, to, the, the, to integrate switch capacitor voltage converters on them. They had traditional problems, so either low efficiency in you know, up to 80% or low um, area utilization. Or, you know, so practical solutions that are deployed in, in practice require off-chip components. We want to integrate this fully and have it to be very energy efficient, exceeding 85% efficiency. Uh, the way how this is done, I'm being uh, hurried up at the moment, that uh, um, we are doing just, we're using rippling power supplies, and uh, we are adapting the clock frequency to go up and down with the, with the supply voltage. Um, this was implemented in a 28 nanometer fully pleated SOI process, which is a, a fairly state-of-the-art process. With, it has you know, high efficiency DC-DC converters on it, um, that are integrated together with a rocket chip. And it was designed using generators for both analog and digital blocks. Um, you know, what we have on this chip is essentially a, a risk scalar core, a vector accelerator, all generated from the generators, custom memories, um, bag generated uh, analog blocks that are fully, uh, you know, talking to a fixed domain anchor um, on the outside and talking to an outside FPGA. This whole thing, miraculously, or due to our design methodology, booted Linux within two hours and uh, um, after we received the chip and is still working today and is being demoed around here. Um, as a result, uh, we also claim, remember what I've said, the processors get the energy efficiencies of about a gigaflop per watt we are at around 34 gigaflops per watt by using this accelerator and ability to run at low voltages. And that's basically it. Um, the IC design is changing and energy efficiency is being achieved through specialization of designs. In order to do that, we still have to, you know, we have to maintain the flexibility and the way how we do that is by um, borrowing many ideas from the, the software development. We are building things that are that can be agilely developed. They use higher level description. We design generators, not instances. We reuse designs and we rely on open source hardware. Thank you very much for your attention.
interesting. Uh, the, I think uh, you answered my question toward the end, but I want to be uh, certain. Uh, and that is, uh, I was going to ask if you use this approach of independent processors, like for example, an independent uh, matrix multiplier. I was wondering how much of an improvement uh, you could look forward to. And uh, did you say at the end you went from one gigaflop per watt to 34 gigaflop? Is, is that approximately 30 times improvement of energy efficiency? Is that right? Correct. So, so few things. So the, this is a compounding question. The, the one, one is if we just built a matrix multiplier that is talking to some kind of a memory and multiplying matrices, um, in floating point you can probably achieve of the order of 100 gigaflops per watt if you can manage to, to run this at, at uh, very low uh, voltages. Improvements here, how we get from 1 to 30 gigaflops, is um, a, a lot of it comes from operating at low supply voltages, which is enabled by a custom chip design, but also by using a specializer. And specializer here is a, is a vector uh, coprocessor, as you would see it, as a vector accelerator that is tightly coupled to this. And this vector machine is uh, taking one instruction and multiplying vectors with it. Right. So th is that a 30 times improvement or a 100 times improvement? So, so there about is the, the theoretical limit? Is that the idea? Yeah. So if you were to build a processor that is just building matrix multiplications and nothing else, no, not able, capable of running anything else, it would be 100% okay. faster. Yeah. You don't mean 100? You mean 100 times? 100 times, yeah. yeah. 100 times, yes. Okay. So, uh, yes. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, let me ask Yeah. Um, Really great talk, Bora. Could you just go back to the slide that uh, showed that performance plot there? Yeah. That. Uh, I want to highlight something that uh, I think is really important, because uh, I think this slide sets a real benchmark for the whole conference. Many people, we're going to hear talks from, I think, a number of uh, folks today on alternative technologies to CMOS. Uh, and typically the trade-off is, yes, we can get these new technologies to work at very low voltage or very low power, but they're slow. So on the one hand, it's really important to see where the benchmark is if you're willing to run you know, a really advanced CMOS design methodology, if you've talked about. Slow it down. You can get up to this 30 gigaflop per watt level. The average frequency, I wanted to get you to just identify what the frequency is. It looks like it's under 100 megahertz. So if you're running, you know, the, at the maximum efficiency point, yeah. this runs at about 50 megahertz. 50 megahertz. Over here, it runs at about 1 gigahertz. Right. So I think that's a really important benchmark for people to be thinking about for the alternative technologies. This is what we can do today in CMOS. So on the one hand, yes, looks like it can be very effective to lower the voltage and lower the operating frequency to get very high efficiency. This is what you have to beat, though, with your alternative technology, right? Correct. There is one disclaimer here. You often need to talk to the memory. And having to talk to the memory drops this by a factor of five or so, the, the, the overall efficiency. OK. <laughs> that should be kept in mind. Thank you. So that, that's sort of an example that efficiency is the uh, key issue, or communication, rather. Uh, um, it's it's yeah. very important. So I started late. <laughs> no. yes. So. Um, Question uh, regarding the ad agile design methodology for mm -hmm. hardware. Um, is there? I, I'm, that sounds like it's very. It sounds very interesting. Uh, but is there any reason that's not completely? Is, is there any reason that that's particularly valuable for specialization, or is it just the way we should be designing everything? I think we should be designing everything that way. Okay. It um, it does help having a limited set of things that we need to, the generators for. Uh, if we were to build a generator for anything in this world, it would, may not have been quite right. practical. And, and regarding the specialization, I have a, a, a different question, which is you mentioned the, the uh, 13 motifs, <coughs> the Berkeley uh, Computer Science uh, Department motifs, which are famous. Um, are those, you know, <laughs> Each of those motifs actually uh, encompasses many different distinct uh, algorithms, which are in some sense computationally similar. But do they really use the same, uh, you know, are they really optimized by the same hardware? Or do you really want to work at that level? Or do you have to pick functions that are more granular in, in terms of your specialization? That, that's a phenomenal question as well. Um, you know, there are many ways how we can implement the FFT fast Fourier transform. And ideally, we would have a generator 
or we'll be developing a generator such that we can implement mu many flavors of FFT or we can have many flavors of uh, matrix multiplication. Some of them can be software programmable or some of them can be just uh, possible instances of a generator. Ideally, that's what we would like to see. Okay, uh, let's thank uh, Laura again.